Today we've got a crazy nuclear revenge story against a fiancé that broke up with someone just weeks before their wedding. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, my roommate told on me, so I snipped off her hair. My goody two-shoes roommate could not mind her business, so I showed her who's boss. This happened in my boarding school where I spent my whole senior year of high school. I had this really annoying, perfect, princess roommate Holly. We used to call her Holy for fun because she totally deserved that nickname. Holly came from a family who played by the rules, so naturally she was the boring, no good joy kill that nobody wanted to be friends with. Sure, she had her little clique of sympathizers, but they were all the way in the other block and somehow, Holly got stuck with us, the good-for-nothing girls. That's what our matron liked to call us. There were five of us, Karis, Adiola, Francesca, or Fran for short, Becky, and me. We had been friends since our first term in the school, so in the final year, we chose bunks close to each other. Even though Fran and Karis resumed late, the rest of us saved a space for them. Everyone else steered clear of our territory at the back corner of the dormitory, as it had always been for the six years we spent in that school. But there were five of us, and each bunk contained two spaces. That meant that one of those spaces will either be left empty or occupied by a non-team player. Luckily for us, there was always more than enough bed spaces in the room to contain all the other girls. We, me and my girls, always had an empty upper or lower bunk to ourselves where we kept our boxes or hung our towels. That term, unfortunately, a bunk was taken out of our room to accommodate the many new first year students. And another space was left damaged since the previous term. I guess it was because the maintenance officers saw that not fixing it was not going to cause a shortage of spaces for us girls. So the result of that was that for the first time, my girls and I were not going to have an empty bed space to ourselves. What was worse was that the space was not occupied by anyone else but good old Holly. We figured that if we created heck for her, she might get fed up and demand a move. Maybe our matron would have switched her with someone more manageable, or maybe they would have just buckled and fixed the damaged bed space. But Holly had thick skin. It was impressive how much she could take without blowing her tops off. In fact, we used to take turns betting on who could piss Holly off. And before you think we were being unreasonably mean, you have not heard of the role she played in warranting that sort of treatment on herself. So, Holly knew that she was not loved by our tight group. We even openly asked her to switch because she was always against the majority of things we did. We never asked her to partake in it, but we weren't going to just stop just because she was there. She was always complaining of our noise after the lights were out in the night, hushing, interrupting, and plainly just being annoying. Any sane person would have complained earlier to those in charge who could move her dorms. But Holly and her sympathizers prided themselves in tolerance and patience. Seriously, it was like how much they could tolerate earned them points in their little coven. There was an insane practice they had of meeting together in the classroom area to discuss all of the things they had to put up with, either in the hostels, in the dining hall, in class, or in the school chapel. Holly did not hide the fact that we were always the theme of her discussions. I told her that instead of complaining to them, she could have just asked to be changed. She replied that she was not complaining, it was called a confession and she would never complain about anything because her religious values were founded on endurance. So there we were. Both teams were managing having each other around but thankfully we had the upper hand. At some point we stopped directing efforts to annoy Holly because it was just a waste of time. It was clear that she was gaining some twisted happiness from seeing us try to vex her and she not yielding. So we just did things like she wasn't there and this pissed her off. We would talk aloud in our corners during siesta or at night when we were supposed to be sleeping. When she complained, we would tell her that she wasn't supposed to be there anyway. And when the lights were out, we took out our torch lights to tell scary stories. She heard them and got very angry. We suggested that she got earplugs and sleep eye masks, which she did. She called her parents with a school phone and asked to send them some. She did all that, but she could not ask for another bunk. It just showed that, although it wasn't convenient for her to remain there, she was gaining some kind of joy in being there. Then we found out this book where Holly and her friends wrote down their suffering. They called the book Persecutions for God. The pages were full of dumb things like her squad called Persecutions. The worst was that they used words like fools and dead for us. 
We confronted them about it, especially Holly. She retorted that they weren't insults, just descriptive words of how we were spiritually. The whole issue caused a lot of tension. We, as sensible school students, went to report the actions of other students that didn't sit well with us. The book got confiscated and Holly and her girls were reprimanded for using those words on her fellow schoolmates. Luckily for us, the content of the book was never read. But even if it was, the things we supposedly did against Holly will not warrant us anything more than a week of cleaning duty. Holly got very cross after that. This is when me and my friends started our scrapbook, where we called all of Holly's friends by their nicknames so that they couldn't report us but they would know we were talking about them. In fact, Holly and her friends never reported anybody, no matter how bad things were getting. We used this against them and named them things like Holy, Misrighteous, Dove, etc. We even used the opposite of what they called us, Life and Shrewd. We intentionally left the book lying around in our corners where we knew Holly could find it. Or we would talk out loud when we were filling the book, knowing she was there. Holly was fed up at some point. She came to us preaching. It started subtly, but soon it became a flat condemnation where she used words like sinners, heck, and other things. I guess that it was her way of getting back at us. So even when Fran, Karis, Adiola, or Becky got angry at her, I was rather calm. Soon her whole gang came to us with words of advice for our poor lost souls. They called us blind and lost. My friends were losing it. I wasn't. I was still calm because I knew I was religious and I knew the Lord in my own way. My parents were also religious, so nothing they said offended me. Sometimes she read scriptures to us, other times they would just quote a popular religious leader. I was God anyway. I mean, I didn't think any of the rule breakage we did against the school was going to take me to heck. Holly thought otherwise, and I could totally tolerate her views, but it wasn't getting to me. It started getting real when they started mentioning our shortcomings like skipping morning devotion or stabbing morning duty and calling the eternal punishment for all our rule breaks. At that point, I knew that they were just making stuff up and I knew why, since they could never go back on their word on ever reporting anyone and what we did to Holly was now getting to her, they had to come up with something to stop us. Winning us over was their perfect plan, but it didn't work. Once they tried sweet and enticing words, then switched to condemnation that was still not yielding the fruit they desired, what Holly did next was the last straw. We were actively pushing for her to be moved at that point. We even told the matron that she was a menace. Of course, we didn't have a good reputation with the matron, so she didn't listen to us. We said that Holly wanted to leave too, but Holly said that she wasn't going anywhere until she got all our souls saved. We kind of deserved that. It was the end of the term and examination period had gotten closer. Everyone was trying to read, but as usual, I had always cheated my way through tests and exams and it worked for me so I didn't care. Fran and Becky were naturally gifted with intelligence that they hardly needed to read while Becky and Karis were in with me on the cheating thing. Like always, it was common knowledge. Even our classmates knew us for it. The only reason they never took it serious was because we tried to get answers correct just enough for us not to fail. We never competed with the highest scorers and left our grades at the level it would never get teachers suspicious. There were many ways we cheated, by smuggling torn pages of our textbook into exams, writing on our palms, writing on our tables, or passing our answer booklets. Basically, I'm not saying what we did was right or wrong, but I cannot deny the fact that we always cheated and it was not hidden. Those exams, however, turned things around. Holly was going at it again, preaching against cheaters and false witnessing, forgery, frauds, and thieves, etc. It was the first exam period that anybody cared what we were doing in the first place. When she went on yammering, I asked her if she didn't have better things to do. She did not relent. I also didn't think she or anybody had the liver to do anything. In fact, they would have chosen to ignore us rather than asking any questions, but not Holly. The exam day came and I was ready with all my scribbling, jottings, chips and dubs. I went to the exams, fully ready to cheat. I did and came out. Holly was watching me, Becky and Adiola during our papers. Whenever she turned back to look at us passing papers, I gave her a nasty face. Then she would shake her head and face her questions. 
Before the next paper, she came to warn me that if I cheated in the next exam, she would do something about it. If it wasn't Holly threatening me, then maybe I would have taken her seriously, but Jolly never reported. But she did. Right during the exams, I brought out my squeezed paper of jotting to spy. At that moment, I caught her eye. Her hands immediately went up. There was no chance for me to beg. When the invigilator noticed her, by then I was already boiling in my seat and so were Adiola and Becky. The teacher came to us and recovered the sheet of paper from my hand, proving Holly right. It still beats me how she never reported her discomfort but told on people who cheated. She said children of light are not supposed to hide the works of darkness. I would have gotten into a physical brawl with her if not that I was already facing the disciplinary committee already for cheating. At that point, you don't want to do anything against the management. I was allowed to continue writing my exams, just under severe scrutiny now. Becky, Ariola, and I were separated from each other and from everyone else. In the meantime, the committee was deciding whether to give me a one-term suspension or a working suspension. As this was going on, I secretly planned Holly's downfall. I may not have known much, but I never agreed with her that it was her faith that told her it was right to do something as heartless as that. I wondered how she could live with herself knowing that the people she told on were around her when she was sleeping in the dorm. Worse was that I was her bunkmate and I could have easily have hurt her at night. I had to resist doing anything to Holly before my punishment got more serious. Deep down, I knew that if I was going to be expelled or suspended, I would hurt Holly back before I left. So on the day that my punishment was announced, The day I was told I would be going home on a term suspension, me and my cohorts, Adiola and Becky as they were called, it wasn't as devastating as our holy snitch thought it would have been. In fact, who didn't want to leave the heck hole of a school? My mother was called and she came to get me and Adiola, Becky's parents sent their driver. We packed our things in the hostel while other students went to class. Frankly, I was relieved that I was suspended because immediately punishment was announced and my school clearance form was signed to leave. Then I ceased to be a student of the boarding school again until my next resumption. That's the way things were and always had been. My mother showed up just in time. It was siesta period for all other students and I was in my school administration block with my clearance form unsigned. Once the approved signature was imprinted on my form, I went to the hostel to retrieve my luggage. And this was my plan, to cut Holly's hair off while I was getting my stuff. The good thing was that it was done while I was declared no longer a student of the school, and also, Holly could never tell that it was truly me who cut her hair. Of course, my girls knew, but she didn't. All other students were asleep during that period. It was the perfect revenge, and I stayed unpunished for that. Fran and Karis later told me that she woke up crying her eyeballs out and blamed them, but they didn't even own a pair of scissors. The very day, Holly was finally moved to another room. She continued being upset because nobody got the punishment for her new crazy hairdo, but she should have not been that mad. After all, it was just another persecution she had to quietly bear. And furthermore, her hair had to be cut really low, like a pixie cut. I gave myself a figurative pat on my back when I saw that she got what she deserved. While I don't necessarily know that they deserved getting their hair cut like that, I do agree that it does seem almost hypocritical that they're willing to complain about some things but not about just getting moved to a different room. Honestly, I think it might very well have just been Holly was stubborn and didn't want to give in and concede that one thing getting moved out of there. I feel like they just wanted to stick it to OP and the girls. Our next story is, fiancé broke up with me weeks before our wedding, so I destroyed his precious book collection. I'm normally a calm person. I like to think with a level head, no matter the situation. I found that thinking with a level head is the only way to actually be in control of a situation, whether good or bad. That was why I was able to prove my innocence when I was accused of stealing my classmates' designer tennis shoes back in high school. I did steal the tennis shoes, but I was never caught because the fear and accusation didn't make me fold up like a blabbering fool, but that's besides the point. There are a few situations in life where I actually lost my cool. Even though it was for a good reason, I never got satisfied in the end because someone got hurt or someone didn't. This was why I stuck to being subtle in anger and hitting my enemies where it hurt. 
A good example of this is what I did to my ex fiance when out of the blue, he decided that our relationship was no longer working and we should break up. I wouldn't have had a problem with this if we were dating casually, but we've been in a relationship for the past three years and we're set to marry in less than a month. Besides, my dad had already paid for the wedding. That's money that he's never getting back. So I decided to hit him where it actually works, his books. But before we proceed, let me take you back to how we met and the timeline from there. It all started with a stupid college assignment. As a third year lit major, I was busier than most of my roommates. I always had one assignment to do or another. After finishing the second semester midterm tests, we were given a class project to work on. It was supposed to be fun. Not the assignment of course, but the fact that I was paired up with my best friends in the class. We were supposed to review a book and relate the protagonist's actions to those of the antagonist in another book. We all had to read both books and come back and discuss and dissect both books. We were facing two major problems with the project. One was the fact that the books were more than 500 pages each and we had a week to turn in the assignment. And the second was that the other book was kinda rare and it was hard to get. For the first problem, we all decided to split the book into chapters and focus on specific parts and talk about them in our next meeting. For the second problem, my friend Lucy talked about an old school bookstore that kept rare books in stock. We decided to check it out. We went there that same day to look for the book, and while I was checking the shelves, I bumped into someone. I turned around and there was a guy behind me. Before I could say anything, he apologized for bumping into me and introduced himself. Let's call him Adam for the sake of the story. I also smiled and introduced myself. He asked me what I was looking for and if I needed any help. Apparently he worked in the bookstore. I named the book and he helped me find it. We talked for a moment about the book and I was surprised to find out that he had read it and the other book we were supposed to work on. I asked him what the relationship was between the two books and even though I hadn't read the books at the time, his reply made so much sense. We spent another 10 minutes talking about other books and I only made to leave when Lucy came to me and started to pull me out of the bookstore. We worked on the books and while I read, I kept what Adam told me about it in my mind. By the time we were done with the project, we were given one of the highest scores in the entire class. That same day, the group decided that we had to celebrate and I decided to invite Adam to hang out with us. I went to the bookstore and collected his number from the clerk. I called him and we talked for a moment. After much persuasion, he decided to hang out with me that evening. We went to a bar close to my apartment, and while everyone else was doing shots, I was looking out for Adam. Eventually, he showed up and we hung out. We talked about more books, and there I discovered that he wasn't just smart, he was funny, kind, and gentle too. I hadn't been in a relationship since I left high school, and because of the heartbreak I faced there, I had sworn off boys for the entirety of college, but for him? I could already see myself saying yes to him if he asked me to be his girlfriend. When it was time to leave, I ditched my friends and decided to walk with Adam. When we got to my place, we stayed outside for another 20 minutes talking about Romeo and Juliet. I found it really nice that he had an intense love for books. He had read literally all the books I have and then some, and I'm the lit major. We said our goodnights then and I turned around to go up into my apartment. I waited for a moment, hoping he'll propose to see me again, but he didn't. He just walked away. I was kind of disappointed, but it wasn't a big deal. The next few days, I didn't hear from Adam. I was tempted to call him, but I didn't want to look desperate, so I kept my cool and went to classes and hung out with my friends, doing everything I could to distract myself from the cute guy from the bookstore. It didn't work. Exactly two weeks after the assignment, I decided that if he wasn't going to reach out to me, I was going to go to him. All I needed to do was to go to the store to borrow a book. I got to the store after class that day and found him near one of the shelves reading a book. We talked for a moment and he apologized for not reaching out to me. He explained that the past week had been crazy with work. I said sure and we talked for a while about the book he was reading. I thought I'd spent nothing more than 20 minutes there, but when I checked my watch, I was surprised to see that hours have passed. I rose up to leave because I had some assignments to take care of. There he asked if we could go out that weekend. I can swear that my insides did cartwheels and backflips that day. 
Even though I tried to keep a cool outlook, I couldn't help smirking. I said sure, and the date was set. I couldn't be more excited than I was in the days leading up to the date. I just couldn't stop talking about Adam, and my roommates were just about tired of hearing about him. On the day of the date, we went to see a movie. It was a very underwhelming movie, and we decided to leave halfway. We spent more time at a diner, talking over burgers and fries. At the end of the date, I was sure. I wanted Adam to be my boyfriend. We started to hang out more often after that day. At the bookstore, sometimes on campus. He even came over to watch a movie at my place one time. It took another month before he invited me to come over to his place. It was way cooler than I expected. He had a whole room dedicated to rare first edition books. The totality of the books were worth six figures easy. That had to be like his favorite room in the whole apartment because he didn't let us spend much time there and he kept the room under lock and key. A few dates more and he finally asked me to be his girlfriend. As I expected, I said yes. Our relationship progressed steadily after that. Adam wasn't the type of guy my friends expected me to fall for. He was the typical nice guy, and I've been known to have a thing for the bad boys even though I didn't date them, but the fact remains I loved spending time with Adam, and he engages me mentally which was something I found really hot. A year later, I was done with college, and since my roommates were also done, we all decided to split up. I wanted to keep the apartment, but Adam had another proposition. He wanted me to move in with him. We had been dating for a while now and we've never had problems, so I didn't hesitate. I said yeah, and we moved in together. The early months were blissful. I stayed at home to work, I was starting a blog for book reviews, while he went to the bookstore. Even with our new arrangement we were still going strong. I don't remember the exact time when it started to fall apart, but I remember our first major fight. I was cleaning the house and I decided to dust off the room where he keeps his books. It was a Saturday and he didn't go to work. That was the only day he sleeps in. So I decided not to disturb him. I took the room key from his wardrobe and went in to clean the room. Halfway through cleaning, he came out of the bedroom and he yelled at me to get out of the room. Apparently I was letting in humidity which was bad for the books. I apologized for my ignorance but for some reason he stayed mad at me for the rest of the day. We were supposed to go out that day but he cancelled the plans. All because I left the door open while I was cleaning. Later that night I asked him if I should order pizza or if he'd like some meatloaf, but still he wouldn't talk to me. I had had just about enough and I decided to hash it out right there. We spent close to two hours fighting about the books. I told him I was only trying to help, but he remained adamant that he never asked for my help on the books and that I should never have entered that room. At one point, I started to think that maybe the books meant more to him than I did. Anyways, after that fight, I decided to steer clear of his book room. And we didn't have many problems after that, at least for the next few weeks. On Thursday night, he came home early from work, and I was still working on a book review. Out of the blue, he asked me when I was going to get started on writing my book. Before then, I don't think I ever told him I was interested in writing a book. I love reading. Yeah, but writing a book. It felt like too much work and I told him that. He said okay and I thought that was the end, but it wasn't. Two years into our relationship, he asked me to marry him. That was the happiest moment of my life and I said yes. I was excited to spend the rest of my life with him and I thought he also felt the same for me, but apparently not. A month after our engagement, he casually told me to get started on my book because a publisher friend of his was in town and he would like to show him the manuscript. At first I was like, what the heck is he talking about? I told him that day for the second time that I had no intention of becoming an author. He didn't say anything after that, but something changed. He wasn't as caring and loving as he had been, and I noticed. He started staying out later than normal, and I just couldn't figure out why. He didn't even bother to chip in anymore to the wedding preparations, which was fast approaching. So one night, I went by the bookstore to check on him, but to my surprise, the clerk told me he had left an hour ago, he hadn't gotten home, and he wasn't picking up his calls. I started to panic, and I asked the guy if he had any idea where he was. He told me he had become very close to one of the bookstore's regular customers, and he gave me the address of the place where they usually hung out. I went over to the restaurant to check it out, 
and to my surprise, he was there with the lady. It looked like a date, so naturally I was furious. I stormed the restaurant with the intention of making a scene, but as soon as I got there, Adam sprang from his seat and pulled me out of the restaurant. He told me that she was a customer from the bookstore, and she was working on her book and he was helping her. Till today, I don't know if that was the truth or a lie because he didn't even let me find out. I was ready to forgive him for not coming home and missing another date night, but to my surprise, he said he couldn't continue with our relationship. I was dumbfounded. How could he just make a decision just like that? I reminded him that we weren't just in a relationship, but we were set to be married in a month, and all the expenses had already been paid for, but he was adamant. He said I wasn't the woman he thought I was, and he fell in love with the idea of me, but not me. That is the craziest crap I've heard in my entire lifetime. The last time I had my heart broken was in high school, but this doesn't compare to it. It was like I was being torn into two. I ran back to the apartment crying and grabbed all my things. Lucy was living a few hours away and I'd already called her and she had told me to come to her place. As soon as I packed all my stuff and was ready to leave, I stopped in front of the door to his book room and an idea came to mind. My parents were going to lose thousands of dollars for a wedding that wasn't going to hold, and for the time I wasted on him and the hurt he made me feel, I decided to take something he loved too. I kicked open his book room and went on a tearing spree. I don't know how many books I destroyed or how much it was worth, but when I was done, I felt better. Next, I grabbed my bags and left his apartment. So is OP going to post an update when inevitably they catch a lawsuit for breaking thousands of dollars worth of property? I mean, like, if they need proof, I'm sure OP's fingerprints are probably all over that unless they used gloves, right? I mean, the best of luck to OP. Maybe the guilt would be enough for the ex to not press charges, but I feel like if they haven't yet, they might in the future. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.